I'm on my third song that I was going to sing this morning. I've changed three times. But you all know me. And I was the reason I changed this third time is because I realized it was Communion Sunday. And I'm going to do something that I miss doing. And when I was a kid growing up, we always sang through our whole communion service. So I'm going to sing for you my Pentecostal communion medley. And it's just really simple. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. You can sing that. It's so easy. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. And then we'd sing, hallelujah, hallelujah.
from day to day it will never lose it will never lose that blood it will never 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 lose it's power hallelujah thank god for the blood today's scripture psalms 147 12 through 20 on page 622 in your Bibles, or 981. Extol the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates and blesses your people within you. He grants peace to your borders and satisfies you with the finest of wheat. He sends his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He spreads the snow like wool and scatters the frost like ashes. He hurls down his hail like pebbles. Who can withstand his icy blast? He sends his word and melts them. He stirs up his breezes and the waters flow. He has revealed his word to Jacob, his laws and decrees to Israel. He has done this for no other nation, for they not know his laws. Praise the Lord. John 1, 10 through 18. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. This is the readings. Happy New Year to you. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Yeah, let's start with our greetings first today. Yeah, let's all rise and say Happy New Year to you, to each other. Now you may be seated. (laughs) I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm excited to... I'm excited about the year 2020. 
It is, it is not just a new year, but the beginning of a new decade. How is that? Hopefully we all learned great lessons from the mistakes we made in the past decade, individually and also collectively. And we may pursue to, pre- to improve our lives and our relationships in new ways. Hopefully our society may overcome extreme divisions and hatred in this new year, new decade. In the year 2020, even though our physical vision may decline a little bit more as we age, but our spiritual eyes may gain 2020 vision, being able to see many things clearly through our spirits. It is New Year, right? As many of you have heard me saying about my resolutions for the last couple of years, I'm considering my resolutions for this year. If I happen to visit Korea again this year, I'll try bungee jumping or hang gliding as I did two years ago. But whether or not I go there, I I will have to decide what I would like to see me doing in this new year. So I used Google Google to search for other people's resolutions (laughs) to see how they are making their minds. In the beginning of my search, I was pretty serious. But at the end, I found myself indulging in more funny funny ones. Here are some funny ones I liked. Somebody said, I was going to quit all my bad habits for the new year. But then I remembered that nobody likes a quitter. (laughs) And somebody else said, I was watching they, watching they drop the ball in Times Square on New Year's Eve. And I thought, this, this is what I have been doing all my years, dropping the ball. <laughs> so I gave up making new resolutions. And someone else also said, my resolution is to read more in the new year. So I put the subtitles on my TV. Okay. Maybe some of you will laugh after you go back home. (laughs) In a sense, we need to learn more important lessons from today's passage, John chapter 1, as we consider our resolutions for the new year. For example, the, the Gospel of John was written much later than other Gospels. There was a generation gap between the Synoptic Gospels, the three Gospels, and then the Gospel of John. So instead of describing the birth stories or the ministry of Jesus in great details, like other Synoptic Gospels, the Gospel of John focused on its theological manifesto, which is, Jesus is the light coming into darkness. Jesus is the light coming into our darkness. That's the big catchphrase or big subject of the Gospel of John. Likewise, we have enough experiences in the past years in making New Year's resolutions, some good ones and some silly ones. So as we begin a new decade, it may be wise for us to be more analytical and more radical in planning our new year. For example, losing our weight sounds like a good plan. But we may need to consider more fundamental or analytical statement to boost our willpower for the the plan. So the question is why? Why do we want to lose our weight? For a good body shape? For a healthier life? Then what? Why do you need a healthier life? Why do you need a good body shape? 
The more fundamental question is that how is our weight control, weight loss, related to, related to framing our life goals? What would, would you like to do if you get a healthier, healthier life through diet? Again, since we have many failures and success in the, in the, in the past in keeping our resolutions, it is time to stir up those those resolutions as, as a whole and think about the undergirding statement or principle in doing all of those. So if you read the chapter 1 of John, it begins with some background of the foundational st- statement. From b- verse 1, it says that Jesus has been a part of creation from the very beginning. Even before Before he came to earth, he was the light of the world that shined in the darkness. But the darkness did not comprehend it. Even a man like John the Baptist testified about the light. People didn't understand him. This background of the foundational statement covers from verse 1 through verse 8. You see, when Jesus proclaimed, I am the light of the world, in John 8, 8, 12, he used the Greek words, ego eimi, which means he always has been and he always will be the light of the world, even before he came to earth and even after he was ascended to heaven. Even before Jesus was born, God had gotten involved in human history. God had been at work in the world through the law, through judges, kings, and prophets. In other words, God has spoken to the people in the world, but through God's, but through God's messengers and through supernatural manifestations. However, in today's passage, verse 9, 9 and 10, It says that Jesus was the true light coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world that was made through him did not know and accept him. Jesus was God's most direct intervention in in human history. The very word of God takes on human flesh and dwells with us in our own human form. After all those years since Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven, the Synoptic Gospel writers focused on illustrating the life of Jesus with great details. Then another generation passed, and the Gospel of John focused on one thing. Jesus is the light coming into the darkness of the world. The focus of John was to emphasize that Jesus came to us to show us the light and to cast out darkness. Jesus himself had to deal with and suffer from the power of darkness, but he finally defeated it through his resurrection. The world, world of darkness, and the light of the world. The world of darkness and the light of the world. This huge dichotomy is the reason of God's inter- intervention. God's created world is covered with darkness. This is enough reason for the Son of God to come into the world because Jesus is the exclusive source of spiritual light. Let me ask you a question. Since it is the first Sunday of 2020, I think we are allowed to give ourselves permission to draw the whole picture from the beginning, new decade, as, we, as if we are God. If you are to solve the five most prominent problems of humanity, how would you choose those five? And how would you solve those five problems? 
I'll give you one minute. Yeah. Is the question too big? Okay, let me try again then. If you are given authority and capability to solve five problems of the United States, what problems come to your mind and how would you solve them? 30 seconds? Because it's smaller. Still too big? Then, okay, try to pick five problems of your family. <laughs> that must be fixed in order to maintain your happy family life. What are they? And how would you fix them? The premise is that in any human problem, there's no such thing like a 50-50 compromise. People may talk about equal share when it comes to investment or taking risks, but the rule does not apply to human relationships in both, in both between individuals and groups. Of course, they, they may want to be treated fairly and share the responsibilities fairly. But who can measure their giving of 50% of themselves? Ironically, if partners base their, their giving on sameness and equality rather than the, the needs of the relationship, such a relationship cannot last long. Because each of them that, considers that he or she is giving more than 50% of themselves already. And the other is not doing as much. In other words, fairness is not the golden rule in human relationships. Understanding each other and working toward the needs of the relationship should be valued more importantly. Maybe one has more personal issues than the other, and one has, more, one has poorer coping skills than the other. Even one of them has self-destructive behaviors, all of which require effective and ex extra support. And, and care from the partner. It does not necessarily mean that their relationship is over because one is more demanding. Sometimes there are different occasions that either of them falls down, but one can help the other up. The one that is used to be strong becomes a weaker one in any cycle of his or her life. We can use a sword, a sword of fairness to cut off human relationships. This is why Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. What about parents and children relationship? How many parents have to have serious troubles, conflicts with their children? If you go to the kids' social media pages, which is open to the public, actually, you will see a lot of them talking about their parents negatively. They say, my parents don't want to listen to me. They don't care about my feelings. They just lay down the law, curfew about our music, our friends, or our clothes. And they just wouldn't budge at all. That's what they write in their social media. In my opinion, if we are to identify five problems of the world, five problems of the United States, five problems of the family, they are all related 
to the incarnation problem. A solution for any human problem stems from an endeavor to help the strong see the problem from the eyes of the weak. The coming of Jesus into the world was God's solution. The Son of God became flesh as the first step of God's solution for humanity. Through his life and actions, Jesus showed every way of God's love for humanity. Through his incarnation, Jesus showed us, showed us the basic principle to solve human problems. Incarnation is the foundation of solving any human problem. Of course, there are big differences between his ministry and our work. He had supernatural abilities and performed miracles, which is not allowed to most of us, generally speaking. Jesus died on the cross but was resurrected, which will not take place in our life until he comes. However, it is obvious from the ministry of Jesus that God expects us to practice the same rule of Jesus, the rule of incarnation. God wants us to go to the people who are desperate, vulnerable, and ignored. The rule of incarnation is the first foundation to solve the broken world, individually and collectively. What about the parents and children relationship again? in terms of solutions. The first step is to abandon the idea of the parents. Like, I know my child because he or she is a chip of the old block. If a mom grew up like a tomboy, for example, she might believe that her daughter would be a rough and tumble kind of person, like she was. However, this is an easy and most common misconception a lot of parents have. Our kids are not a chip off, chip, chip off the old block. They grow in different ways and different steps. In fact, a child's home environment is only one of, the, one of a range of factors that influence who he or she will become. So listen to their feelings, listen to their stories, their struggles before we set the law for them. Parents need to incarnate to help their child and to solve their relationship problems with their kids. Get familiar with their rhythm and embrace their ways of revealing their stories. Again, incarnation is the rule for solution in human relationships. We learn this rule from Jesus Christ, who became flesh for humanity. There was a gentleman who was looking at the paintings in Smith, Smithsonian Art Museum in New York. He looked at paintings on the wall, standing up. Then he kneeled down to look at the paintings. He did the exactly the same procedure for each painting, looking at it with standing up, then kneeling down. Sometimes he moved back and forth. And he looked the picture from far away and too close up. Especially when he saw the big size paintings, he did that. Then one of the employees in the museum approached him and asked why he looked at the paintings in such a weird way. 
Then the gentleman replied, I'm an elementary school teacher, and I'll bring my kids next week. I tried to look, the, look at the paintings from the height of the kids to see if they may look the same or different in their eyes. And I have some ideas now, like for the big pictures, big paintings and tall paintings, they may have to move a little further away from the picture to see the whole painting. This is the way of incarnation, to look at the object from the eyes of the weak. And brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the practice of incarnation, to see the objects and, and problems from the eyes of the weak the vulnerable, from the eyes of the unprivileged. As the conclusion of my sermon, I'd like to uh, suggest some New Year's resolutions for you. You may consider ways in which you can practice incarnation. You may visit or volunteer in a place like Benincasa. You may bring snacks and drinks to camera ministry. You know how, how much they eat. The kids eat, right? They need a lot of snacks. And that's what I do a lot of times when I pass by that facility. You may visit Open Door, open door Mission and attend their daily worship. There is a worship every day. And you just sit there and be with them. That's another way of doing it. You may go to the library, like a Maplewood library, where there are many immigrants and refugees and their kids. You may ask them if there are any simple voluntary, voluntary opportunities. You may join the discussion groups in, in the library to discuss poverty issues with other people. I believe one-time participation is a very good start. Once in every quarter is superb. Wherever we can relate to the incarnation of Jesus is fine and great. Wherever we can embody the rule of incarnation is fine and great. And I hope and pray that this is one of your major resolutions this year that undergirds all other resolutions in your personal life. John chapter 1, 12 says, To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What does that mean? It means whoever accepts him, accepts Jesus, fully and wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly as the light of the world becomes a child of God. Whoever embraces his way of love, the rule of incarnation, is proven to be a child of God. May God touch your heart and make you be like Jesus this year. May the love of God be with you all throughout the year 2020. Amen.